Let us join our voices in praising God, gracious creator of the earth and all its peoples. Happy are those whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and on God's law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water. In all that they do, they prosper. <laughs> The Lord be with you, and also with you. Grace and peace to you this Sunday as we gather for worship online and virtually, and we are glad that you're worshiping with us at Westminster Presbyterian in Lincoln, Nebraska. This Sunday is a special Sunday. For one, we are celebrating communion, the Lord's Supper, which Christ taught us and beckoned us to continue to do in tradition in our faith. But also, it is World Communion Sunday, a Sunday where we celebrate and remember 
that this meal is one that unites Christians throughout God's world in all nations and places. It is a wonderful Sunday, and I hope that you will celebrate communion with us. And that is a good segue to remind you that as you prepare to celebrate communion at home, we invite you, if you need to pause or take a break, to go prepare the elements, some sort of bread or grain or gluten-free bread and some sort of juice or wine or a beverage of the cup that can celebrate what God means to us and what God's grace means is known to us in Jesus Christ and in this meal. So I hope that you'll take a moment to prepare that and also be prepared to celebrate an offering, a special offering of the PCUSA, our denomination, the Peace and Global Witness Offering. This is a Sunday where we normally would collect that in our sanctuary, but we invite you in the days to come to send in a check and to make that check out to the peace offering in the memo line at, at care of the Westminster Presbyterian Church. That offering is unique in that it goes to serve and to empower those who are working for peacemaking throughout our world. We will have some funds that Westminster distributes, some funds that our Presbyterian Synod distribute, and some funds that are distributed through the PCUSA. It's a wonderful opportunity for us to find a way to financially and tangibly serve people in our world and to serve God's way of peace. I also want to say a thank you as we're thinking about offerings to all of you who continue to donate and who continue to give thanks to God through the offering of our financial funds. We want to be a church that celebrates gratitude and as our response to God's grace. So as we celebrate gratitude, we do that through our worship, we do that through our service, and we do that through our giving. So I just want to let you know that we are thankful for the continued giving in the life of this church so that we may serve others and so that we may worship with gladness. So now I invite you to prepare your hearts and minds for a service of communion. Let us worship the Lord with gladness. Hear my prayer, O oh Lord, hear my prayer. When I call, answer me. O oh Lord, hear my prayer, O oh Lord, hear my prayer. Come and listen. Let us boldly confess our sin before the one who already knows our errors and is gracious to forgive our sins. Almighty God, Mother of mercy, Father of grace, you have called us to one table, but we have pursued our own course. You have promised us the abundance of all creation, but in our greed and in our envy, the world goes without. You have promised us the bread of life itself, but in our pride and in our arrogance, the world goes hungry. You have promised us the waters of peace and justice, but in our violence and in our discord, the world goes thirsty. And now we are famished too, Lord. Have mercy on us, forgive us, Transform us at Christ's table. Instruct us by your words and send us to be bearers of your grace and peace. In the name of Christ, our Savior, we pray. Amen.
The mercy and grace of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Believe and share the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are a new creation. As we prepare our hearts and minds to hear God's holy wisdom in words read and proclaimed, let us pray. God of grace, by your Spirit's presence and interceding, transform our hearts by the word read and proclaimed. Enliven our minds by the depth of the world that surrounds Holy Scripture and extend our hands by the call that you share with us today. Amen. Today we continue our series on encountering grace, or God's grace. And we shift today to a scripture from the Christian Old Testament, or the Jewish Torah, from the book of Exodus. So here now, select verses from Exodus chapter 20. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. 
You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When all the people witness the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood off at a distance. And they said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, for God has come only to test you and to put the fear or awe of him upon you, so that you do not sin. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I've noticed a recent phenomenon in our culture where it seems like every day of the year, even leap years, are tied to some sort of celebration or recognition. Some are serious, and some may be a little superfluous. For example, just recently on Thursday, September the 24th, you may have celebrated National Cherries Jubilee Day. Now, if you're a Cherry's Jubilee fanatic, I imagine you ate this dessert and you wore cherry red from head to toe that Thursday. Now, I'm not making that up. In case you're wondering, National Cherry's Jubilee Day is one of many celebration days that were started by different food companies or agricultural organizations to promote their products. I'm guessing the cherry lobby was behind Cherry's Jubilee Day. Also recently, just this past week, Monday, September the 28th, one of my favorites, National Ask a Stupid Question Day. Now, if you ask your church staff how I'm doing in this transition to Westminster, they might say that the past three weeks have been an ongoing celebration of Ask a Stupid Question Day. Celebrated by your new pastor as I try to get acclimated to where things are in the church and where things are in the office and how things work day to day at Westminster. Interestingly, the story behind it, Ask a Stupid Question Day is that it was started in the 1980s by teachers who wanted to encourage students to ask more questions and consequently to embrace the old saying, there's no stupid question. I kind of like the reverse psychology of that celebration. Thursday, October the 1st, included two food-related days that I know I can get behind. First, National Homemade Cookies Day and International Coffee Day. Thankfully, I was able to celebrate with some amazing homemade cookies that were gifted to my household by the Meltons. And honestly, every day is International Coffee Day for me. I love coffee. Now, I'll be honest, I love to find reasons to celebrate things that are meaningful to me, but recently I've been wondering if every day of the year commemorates some type of food or music or personal interest, do we start to begin to lose sight of the celebrations and the moments that really matter the most to us? In the life of the church, we have many celebrations and services that fall at particular times in our church calendar, and I value all of those. And today is one such Sunday. Today is World Communion Sunday. It's a Sunday that I think should be important to us, and I know that Westminster values World Communion Sunday as part of our worship life together. 
We've already referenced World Communion Sunday and the announcements. We've sung a hymn that was written and commissioned for our partnership with our sister congregation in Lohmann, Germany. By now, I hope you've noticed the flags of the many nations here in our sanctuary, flags that can remind us of this celebration. So World Communion Sunday is a day where we recognize that unity in Christ is bigger. Unity in Christ is bigger than the borders and the boundaries, the walls, the open spaces, and even the policies that separate nations. World Communion Sunday is a day where we remember that our faith in God and our identity in Christ are the realities that should define our whole lives. World Communion Sunday is a day where we celebrate communion with a mindfulness toward Christ's instructing grace. Grace for his followers in all times and in all places as he teaches us to eat and the bread and drink of the cup in remembrance of his life, death, and resurrection. Simply stated, here's why I think World Communion matters. World Communion Sunday is a day of grace that teaches us, a day that reminds us of our call to instruct each other and to instruct our neighbors about God's grace while we also are open to learning from our neighbors. So in light of today's learning opportunity on World Communion Sunday, I want us to turn our minds to the instruction that God shared with the Israelites in the wilderness. Leading up to Exodus 20, we must remember that generations of Israelites had lived under captivity and slavery in Egypt. The most recent pharaoh that they knew led with an increasingly brutal and authoritative hand toward the Israelites. But in time, Moses, a leader called and led by God, would emerge to share God's instruction to the Israelites as they were liberated by God's grace alone through the waters of the Red Sea. Today's text finds the Israelites in the wilderness as they've been restless. When the people complained of their need for food, though, God provided manna. When the people quarreled over their thirst on the journey, God provided water from a rock. And in those moments, Moses has acted as God's representative in the wilderness, displaying acts of grace and of care, arbitrating amongst the peoples as they argued. And as we hit chapter 20, we find that God has called Moses and his interpreter Aaron up Mount Sinai for a powerful moment of instruction and of grace. This is instruction that has been taught over and over, instruction that has even shaped the rules and laws of societies and cultures thousands of years through to today. When we read these Ten Commandments with a mindfulness for God's instruction, I believe it's important for us to be asking a crucial question. That is, what is this passage teaching me about God today. So I want us to briefly look at three places where we learn about God in Exodus 20. First, we should note that God starts the instruction not by saying, here are the rules you've got to follow or I'm going to smite you. Instead, God says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. God does not first speak by laying down the gauntlet of rules. God first speaks holy words of comfort and of grace, words that remind the people of God's love first and foremost. Here Yahweh is saying, as you quarrel in the wilderness, are you not remembering who I really am? And what I have done for you. I am the God who delivered you out of a much worse situation in Egypt. 
I am the one who promised and continues to promise that you will thrive and flourish. So what? Instructing grace starts with remembering who God has been in our lives. So today, I think we should be asking ourselves, where have we experienced God? Both in those large, life-changing milestones of growth and in the everyday experiences of our lives. Perhaps in the call from a grandchild or a note from a friend or a knowing embrace from a spouse after a hard day. Where have you experienced God today? The second place I want us to look at is to recognize that God moves into ten teachings that gave the Israelites a clear set of behaviors that I think can foster healthy and faithful relationships. The first five teachings, or what we now call commandments, share a vision for what it looks like to worship God and to honor God in daily living. The second five teachings, or what we now call commandments, share a vision from God of what it means to live life among other people in community. We've got to ask the question, so what? Well, once we've remembered who God has been in our lives, instructing grace moves us from remembering who God is to the tangible calling of a more faithful life that values relationships, a life that worships God above all our other allegiances or commitments, a life that cares for others, a life that honors my neighbors, honors where they've been, what they own, who they love, and seeks to work and to serve others so that they may flourish too. Third, and lastly, we don't just encounter God's grace up on the mountain or in the sanctuary. We encounter God's grace down on the ground, out in the wilderness, in our homes amongst our families, in our community amongst our neighbors. See, the Israelites down at the foot of the mountain, men, women, children, elders, all of them experienced the sound of God thundering in the wilderness. And there, as Moses stood amongst his neighbor Israelites and heard them voicing a fear of God, Moses gave his own instruction in grace, saying, Do not be afraid. God is booming in the wilderness so that you'll be reminded of God's power and might, so that you'll be in awe of God's promises, so that you'll find a sense of wonder that invites you to worship together. Moving that question to today, so what? Well, instructing grace comes in those teachers and mentors and grandparents and kindergartners who find the words that show us how to be less fearful and to be more gracious. More gracious in our theology or understanding of God, as well as in how we interact with and learn from our neighbors, whether they're in Lincoln or Lithuania, or Libya. Why? Because we are to be people who continually seek new understanding and perspective. Perspectives that might move us from lives of fear to lives marked by God's grace. Hebrew scholar Will Gaffney, I think, helps us with this concept of broadening our perspectives as we learn about grace. She writes about this passage in the Ten Commandments and reminds us that on the day that the Torah was given in Sinai, all the people saw God for themselves in the lightning and thunder. It wasn't just Moses and the burning bush anymore. And then Dr. Gaffney invites us to wonder what that might have been like for the entire community. Not just for the men, but for the women who are standing in that crowd as well. And she writes this. I can imagine what some of the women saw when they saw God. Some heard thunder and some heard bird song. 
Some saw lightning and some saw rainbows. Some saw a robe of many colors, others blinding white, yet others deepest midnight spangled with the stars of heaven. Some felt the earth move and others felt the wind blow, and all of them saw God. Yet none of their descriptions alone, nor even all of them together, were sufficient to convey the majesty of the Lord. As Dr. Gaffney reminds us, no one gets it exactly right, and that all of us together have much to say and much to learn about God's grace. The story reminds us of the unity God's people had in all of their identities and nations. The story teaches us the importance of hearing the range of perspectives and stories within our own church family, in our neighborhood, and throughout God's world. Frankly, it's hard for me to hear the Ten Commandments these days without eventually thinking about Jesus and thinking about those stories of the gospel where the law was summarized with Christ teaching to love God and to love our neighbor. Ultimately, I'm reminded of Christ's own instructing grace, rooted in that Jewish Torah and the commandments, shared in teachings on the kingdom and the nature of God, and lived out through welcoming, healing, and engaging those on the margins of society, and also enacted in his own practice of the Lord's Supper on the night of his arrest, breaking bread and sharing wine with his disciples, from Matthew to Mary. So unlike International Coffee Day or Homemade Cookies Day, World Communion Sunday stands out because it teaches us about God's grace in a unique and powerful way. So this week, when you take the bread and the juice or the wine as Christ taught us, Ask yourself, so what? What does this meal mean to me? What does this meal teach me about God's grace? In closing on this particular World Communion Sunday, my own answer to that question is that I have so much to learn about how God's grace unites believers in this common meal all around the world. How God unites us in this common ritual and sacrament that is celebrated in homes around the world. You know, I've traveled to Guatemala several times as part of a partnership between a presbytery in Alabama and the presbytery of Chisek. And when I've celebrated communion in Guatemala, I've heard the words of institution in the languages of English, Spanish, and Quechi, all in the same service. And in hearing those words in three languages, I've learned so much about the wideness and the power of God's instructing grace. So as we celebrate the Lord's Supper in just a few moments in our own homes, I pray that we might all be encouraged to reflect on the grace that we have known, remembering always that it is a grace that meets us with open arms. It is a grace that claims us before we can even speak of it. It is a grace that instructs us on how to live and how to love, and it is an amazing, amazing grace that guides our feet today while we run the race of faith in the name of Jesus Christ. May this meal remind you of such grace and teach you of such grace today. To God be the glory. Amen.
friends, set before us is the joyful feast of God's people. I want you to hear these words from the prophet Isaiah. On the day of the Lord, God will make for people of every nation a feast of rich foods and of well-aged wines. The Lord will destroy the shroud that is cast over us, and God will swallow up death forever and wipe away every tear. On this World Communion Sunday, let us be reminded of our siblings in Christ throughout the world as we celebrate this meal together. Let us be reminded of what unites us in faith, both the power of the Holy Spirit in this meal, but also in the simplicity of our practice that we do wherever we are. Friends, this table is not Westminster's table. This table is not even a Presbyterian table. This is God's table. So let the feast fill us in heart and mind and spirit. Friends, let us pray. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God and his right to give our thanks and praise. Eternal God, we praise you for your love, bringing order out of chaos, leading captives into freedom in the Exodus, calling wandering children home, giving bread to the hungry and drink to the thirsty, and binding the faithful in your covenant of grace. Lord, we thank you for in the fullness of time, Jesus, our Savior, word made flesh, light of the world, living water, bread of heaven, cup of salvation, resurrection, and life came into being. In Christ we are saved, and in Christ we are one. So help us to honor Christ in our daily living. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ Jesus. Lord, empower us so that we may follow Christ's hope for his followers to be one in our worship and in our service of peacemaking and grace. Let us remember that great is the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. And now, remembering Christ's instructing grace, let us pray the prayer he taught his followers. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, hear now the words of the institution of the Lord's Supper. The Apostle Paul writes that on the night of his arrest, our Savior sat at table with his disciples. And he took the bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. And now, let us celebrate and remember Christ's body given for us. Friends, and in the same way, Christ took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Every time you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. Friends, every time we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. Thanks be to God.
And now let us celebrate Christ's cup. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for this feast of grace indeed. As we have been served, help us to serve our neighbors. As we have been fed, help us to feed all who are hungry. And as we have been shown your grace, help us to show your grace to the world. Because in Jesus Christ, you truly have met us with grace. And so we are grateful. Amen. As we come together to celebrate World Communion Sunday and participate in the Peace and Global Witness offering, please join me in prayer. From every place on this planet, we turn our face to you, O God. Gather us, all your people, together to pray. In the midst of the forces which would separate us, bind us in your love as the church together. Strengthen us through the grace of your people gathered, no matter how we gather, with the truth of your presence. In a world aching to be made new, we cry out with those who suffer the pains of what powers and principalities extract from the world's poorest. We cry out with those suffering from illness and disease at whom the world turns a callous glance. We cry out with those who grieve in the face of death and loss. Today, we remember the life and service of Barbara Solomon, a member of Westminster for nearly 80 years. For those who grieve, we pray for your comforting presence to draw near. We also pray for Carol Shelbourne and family at the death of her nephew. May your peace that passes understanding surround them today. We cry out with those seeking justice, equality, and peace peace at all times and all ways. In a world stretching toward wholeness, we celebrate with those whose lives bear the fruit of your spirit and seek to share in your call to partnership. Today we give thanks for and celebrate the 103rd birthday of Fern Beek. As we celebrate, we ask that we may all be inspired to live faithfully all of our days. We celebrate with those whose efforts are making the world new. We celebrate with all who gather to earnestly seek your transforming work in the world. Make us a world that grows into the shape of your communion table, where all are welcomed and all are fed. Make us a people who grow by your family, by practices of mutuality, generosity, and justice. And may we be found to be witnesses when Jesus returns to the truth of who we were created to be, people who belong to each other, people who belong to you, O oh God. In the name of your Son, Jesus, amen. Friends, on this World Communion Sunday, I hope that you will be encouraged and empowered to remember those throughout the world who celebrate God's grace at the table today. And I hope in remembering that, we will all be encouraged to hear new voices and to hear new perspectives through around the world so that we may be instructed in God's grace so that we may learn the character of God's grace, and so that we may be called and invited and respond by being more 
gracious ourselves. And now, may the grace of God, the love of Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this and every day. Amen.